Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a bit of a while since Jeff and I joined you on the vlog. Um, firstly, my apologies. I've, as you've probably heard, lost mum uh, not that long ago, and I'm caring for her, chasing the NHS, trying to get them to actually give her some proper medical care. That's taken a huge amount of time. Now she's gone, we're back at work. A bit slow time at the moment, but Balkan Fury is very close to complete, I believe. I need to check one or two more scenarios and fix one file, and that's the game ready for press. Madagascar has been ready for press since the middle of September, so hopefully we can get that off for the next few days. Uh, Jeff here is going to update you on what he's been doing with the fun and games with World War One, and I can also tell you that I'm down to I think it's about eight Fletcher class destroyers for Watchtower and the rest of the games. I still have 150 uh, <laughs> gearing and Allen M Summers class um, destroyers, but that an awful lot of them don't do a lot so that isn't too bad and once we get into the bigger ships that becomes interesting again you get sucked into it you do it a bit quicker so that hopefully gives you all an idea of where we're going to watch there and as usual we're probably going to make some comments about ukraine which you may or may not be able to see on the map that we've got shared I don't think you can, to be honest, but uh, we can always do something with that at, at some point. We can certainly put up the link uh, in the description below, so you can have a wee look at what we've been peering at here. Uh, and other than that, we might comment in Gaza, we might not. Um, we'll see how time goes, because we don't want to spend too much of your time this evening. Jeff, where are we at with World War One? Right, um, with the... Uh, Polish, polishing off some final RN stuff, but I'm really getting into the Germans now. Uh, I've got their sub sorted, nice and quick and easy. They don't they don't have that many for the counters. I'm currently working on their cruisers, and effectively they produce a grand total of ten or two protected cruisers and about seven or so armored cruisers. And what I've been doing is, because the Germans have access to the Kiel Canal. They can transfer forces between the North Sea and the Baltic with extreme rapidity. Therefore, what I've been doing is working out what bits of the Baltic do I need to mention, because it will be slightly on the map. Um, you will have the opportunity to uh, transfer stuff yourself between the Baltic and the North Sea, and you'll have to take into account shifts in the war between Germany and Russia. And ultimately, I've mostly got the protect cruiser sourced. I'll get the armored cruisers done soon. I've done first Bismarck already. And then after that, it will be um, the dreadnoughts, sorry, the pre-dreadnoughts, the destroyers. And then I'll just move on to all the itty bitty American stuff. And at the very end of this whole process, just get all the sexy dreadnoughts done for the Brits, the Americans, the Germans all in one go. So good progress. Just need to keep going at it and uh, get something done every day. Yeah. But the, it, more the German Navy is uh, so much better than the uh, HMS, what's my name, protected cruiser cooking around Singapore for five years. It's so much nicer to not have to deal with that. Yeah, and, and also you'll be you'll be finding the same thing I found, that the smaller navies tend to be much easier to handle. They, they tend not to bugger off around the planet. They tend not to just drive up the wall by doing weird stuff. And, um, you know, the, the other little advantage we've got is that most, if we need a mobile asset, it's probably going to have some callers or something, you know, calling chips. Callers, whereas I've got to look at the US fleet train at some point, Corey. I know we've done a lot of that, but we need to double check it so we've got it right. And that's huge, you know. Um, I'm aware of about 80 or 90 fleet destroyers mucking about protecting it. And the Americans have so many destroyers, but even so, that's a fairly high percentage of the force is tied up doing that um, specific job. Anyway, so that gets us where we're at. Um, we are more or less in a position to start looking at transcribing some of the stuff that we've got from other sources into game files for the World War One stuff, but I think I'll let Jeff finish what he's doing because most of that is essentially copy typing out files. It's not that bad. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to it though. Anyway, so 
we've all been hearing in the press, I know I have here, that there's a massive Ukrainian offensive which is hugely successful. Um, that was the publicity to begin with. We have actually identified that around Orkiv, uh, which is a place that's so small I didn't even know it existed. I don't actually think we've got it in our Barbarossa maps, guys. So it's south, southeast of Zaporizhia. Um, the deepest penetration they've managed is 10 kilometers in six months. In fact, there's so little going on. I have an acquaintance who went to Zaporizhia for their family holiday. Because they're from there. And they tell me you get the odd little warning, uh, but nothing much ever happens. That's eyewitness testimony, guys. I'm aware there's actually been a lot more rocket strikes up around Kiev and Belgorod, again from people I know, um, than being my own. Especially within Russia. All of them are unguided, none of them are targeted, and it's exactly the same strategy the Russians have been using. So, little attitude correct, correction here, guys. War is dirty, it's a horrible thing. No one likes it. But Ukraine is not the only victim now. This is getting worse and worse and worse, and everybody's doing nasty stuff. Further enough about Avdivka, it would appear the Russians are counterattacking, and there was a couple of signs that there may be an development in process there. But of course, the way this war has gone, it's highly unlikely that will actually work very well. And again, south of Kharkov, there are a series of attacks um, from Lushansk um, westwards. Uh, again, the Russians have made a very grand, but nothing too exciting. So, am I right saying this is a stalemate, Jeff? Yes. Currently, yes. <laughs> Though the the usual caution to just to make sure we always try and keep in mind the attrition rates. Uh, whoever breaks first. Um, but yeah, in terms of territory, there there is no real movement currently. I remember when we were discussing this on the phone last week. You were saying that one of the key elements everyone seems to be missing is lack of engineers. If the Ukrainians are finding it difficult to demine by hand, the Russians seem to be going at snail's pace and they get caught in the open by cluster munitions near Avdivka. It really just suggests that the, some of the support elements of these armies are just not present. I do also know that it's possible the Russians with their defensive belt it is absolutely possible they have utilized one billion mines in this defensive belt. It's one of the thickest minefields ever laid. So that's going to be a problem for the Ukrainians. I would like to know why the Russians are so slow in turn, though, because the Ukrainians will not have laid a defensive belt that much. Yeah, the part of it might be the same thing that screwed up bits of things like El Alamein and Kursk. Once you lay the mines, even if you got a map, you still got to get through your own minefield. Yeah, you know it's that simple. And having had a little look at force structure, it's entirely possible that neither combatant has sufficient mine clearing capability. At that point there, you might be down to, you are frequently down to enemy, a guy with a bayonet trying to touch the edge of the mine without blowing up. Mm. And please bear in mind that during World War II, the Red Army had a, I put it, more direct way of mine clearing. Because essentially you just get uh, punitive units lining them up and say, go forward, comrade. Um, and that was your mine clearance. And the Germans haven't, didn't ever lay a billion mines or whatever that was. You know, it's a huge number. Mm. Um, the other problem I think we're going to find, even if a lot of that is fake news or, or dodgy stats, both NATO and the Warsaw Pact used to have, and probably still have, the ability to artillery deploy minefields at short notice. Exactly. So even if you've only laid half a million mines in belts, which would possibly be a better number, I guess, you might well be able to lay a few hundred thousand more here and there real fast where it makes a difference. 
And essentially, although you may have broken through mine belt one, as soon as you look like you're going to break through it, someone just puts in a fire mission and drops some more mines in front of you. And the problem with artillery spread mines is that the side that fired them won't know where they are because they're randomly dispersed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it's, so, so, so you're you're then back at effectively. Oh shit! How do we get through this? You know, and whilst depending on the map source, you know, if you look at the Google version, it, it, it kind of indicates that there has been some kind of um, counteroffensive previously. The fact that nothing has moved since the initial move forward, move back of the front lines indicates to me that um, we have a military stalemate. The defence is winning, the and this starts to smell an awful, lot, smell like an awful lot like something like the Somme, like the Somme or Verdun, where Verdun, neither side Verdun, could really advance particularly really efficiently. efficiently. Mm. And you know, are we going to get to a passive st style thing here, where you, you, you take one belt of defences and wait, move it forward, do it again? That... I'm beginning to wonder if that's what the Ukrainians have tried to do with that little bulge they've carved. Have they taken a couple of trenches and they want the Russians to come and get at them um, so they can just kill more Russians? Is there any point in pressing forward where you're just going to come up to more trenches? And keep in mind, the Russians have done some rather clever things with these trenches. They've booby trapped them so they can self-destruct the position once the Ukrainians have taken them. So <laughs> is it just better to take a trench, demine it, if you can, quickly as possible, and then ask the Russians to throw themselves at the position? It's, it's really crap for positional maneuver warfare. But at the moment, what are you going to do? Well, I mean, to be fair, I mean, this is an old Russian trick. They, they did it in Kiev when they pulled out of Kiev. They booby mm. trapped various headquarters buildings and the Germans took them over. They've dynamited them. You know, this is not new. <laughs> it's quite old. And I'm pretty sure other people have done it. I, don't, I haven't mm. gone digging, but I'm sure we'll find it if we do. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it goes to me it just looks like a mess. Yeah. Um, do we know if the Air Forces are doing anything yet, Jeff? Not really. Uh, the Ukrainians managed to whack a couple of Russian helicopters, um, well, a, a decent number of them, apparently. Um, though that'll that'll fall off as the Russians adapt, as per usual. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Fly low. Usually works. Yeah. Minimize exposure. Well, it's 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 the helicopters in the um, in the various air bases with long range missiles. They hit them uh. with their ATAC. <laughs> So they'll just spread them out, you know. Yeah. How it is. Yeah. Um, the uh, the only thing that really strikes me as interesting, no, in term is as dynamic, um, is the fact that the Black Sea is becoming uh, rapidly a ship-free zone because of guided missiles. Um, Putin, with his new diet, has managed to lose a kilo, which I think <laughs> is quite impressive. Um, with that submarine being blown up, um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, what I'm finding very interesting is that with a Mediterranean style sea, like the Black Sea, you're increasingly going to find that the docks are vulnerable to missiles, to artillery. And what I want to know is, at what point is that going to force Mediterranean powers, inland sea powers, to try and build their shipyards under greater protection? So are you going to see a greater increase in U-boat style concrete pens or even or even just underground? You know, this is not going to be something that's going to be going away and it's only going to get worse with stuff like Storm Shadow that can hit uh, shore based installations. Because with ships on the sea, you just go more submersible stuff. That That's fairly simple. We know how to do that. It's more expensive. It's more impractical, but we can do that. But stuff mm. on the shore. How do you deal with a couple of missiles that can get through and hit a thin-skinned ship and dock? You know? um, you're always going to have that problem. Um, it, it's 
cost and effective to go underwater with large cargo vessels. It's that simple. And as long as people want to fly some form of drone or aircraft, uh, somewhere that's out of range of your own territory, you need something to launch it from. And that generally tends to be something big and ugly. And ugly. Mm. You know, I, I, I believe that they, I believe we call them aircraft carriers. Uh, the, the, the interesting mm. thing is when when I'm looking, I, I found MarineTraffic.com. Mm. Uh, it's a website. It's probably worth people taking a quick look at because yes, there are areas of the the Black Sea which you wouldn't really want to go into, according to this. But there's still quite a lot of traffic in and out of uh, Romania. A little bit of traffic in and out of Odessa, not much. And a surprising amount through the Kerch Straits and into Novorossiysk. Uh, I wonder if I can share this. Hold on a minute. Here we go. So, if you take a look at it, that is Romania over here. Odessa is here. Rostov, Novorossiysk, right here. So, it's not quite a ship free zone yet. No. And obviously, there's a huge amount of traffic in and out, what I suspect is Turkey and Georgia. But how much is that civilian traffic? Is, is it tra tracking any military stuff at all? Presume not, but. Not that I'm aware of. No. That's what I was meaning. You know, the whole uh, military, st the Russians having to withdraw their military, um, some of their military assets. Oh, I don't know where they're withdrawing it to, but they're taking it from Sevastopol. Um, yeah, no, civilian traffic is doing all right. Um, uh, to be to be fair, um, the Russian Navy seems to have had all kinds of problems um, um, with this. In any case, but as we discussed previously, they do seem to have a lack of defensive capacity in their ships. At that point there, guys, you got a problem. Yeah, if, you, if you can't protect your own vessels, you end up the same mess the Royal Navy was in off the Falklands with, you know, a, a very small number of exosets being a much bigger threat than, 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 you than you might think. We could make a really direct comparison there, John, because what decade were a lot of the Russian vessels currently being used relevant? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a few and of them then. Or and just here's the it. thing, is it possible that some of the problems being encountered by the, the RN back then are some of the things the Russians might be encountering now? I mean, I think, I think firing, that's a very valid firing point. Buttons, firing buttons encrusted with sea salt, for crying out loud. There's, there's some horrible stuff I've read about with, um, oh, not Coventry, uh, not Sheffield. Oh, Antrim, Glamorgan. Possibly. It, it, it might be Antrim. But there's a point where a Cedar refused to fire and the commander is hammering at the button. Mm -hmm. It just won't move. Seesaw was just the interface itself has failed. So I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if the Russians are discovering all of that stuff. Oh, to be fair, there is a big difference between sailing about in peacetime, about in peacetime. and doing some tests and exactly. sailing about getting shot at. Mm -hmm. You know, that's... That's something that every Navy discovered in World War Two. Um, they discovered it in World War One as well. When push comes to shove. Um, in fact, in World War One, the gap technologically between older ships and your ships is much bigger than you might realise. When you know, when you and I have looked at some of the stuff, the earlier armor cruisers and so on, essentially, are a waste of time. Uh, as are all these protected cruisers or unprotected scout cruisers or whatever the hell. They are not really um ships you can put in the battle line no you know uh and as the germans themselves discover later on at jutland their pre-dreadnoughts a reliability if engaged by dreadnought battleships you know um i guess everyone already knew that to some extent but i don't think it was realized just how big the technological leap had been there is a point to be made for the Germans, in all fairness, that every time, um, well, the, the two times they have major fleet engagement, um, it's the obsolete stuff that saves them. 
the Blucher, and yes, I know a lot of this is down to the Royal Navy not knowing how to communicate, but the Blucher <laughs> slows down, that's bait, they take out that. Uh, second Battle Squadron, it has been argued that when the German Free Dreadnought surged forward to engage the Grand Fleet, uh, that actually covered the withdrawal of the high seas fleet but just long enough for them to vanish and for the Grand Fleet to miss them, which means, ironically, mm. uh, the, the, the Free Dreads actually saved the Germans' asses. Um, but then, you know, could you argue that with without that stuff, would the Germans be faster? Would they have not been in that position in the first place? Certainly, possibly, yeah. Also, also, I think there's yeah. a thought in the back of the German mind there that you can sacrifice them, but the cost is too high because mm. the crew sizes are not that different. You know, you get more firepower out of a dreadnought. Or a battle cruiser, and that, that's a key point, you know. So, is it all of that is really interesting? I think the Ukraine war is just a mess, uh, and and I'm going to very briefly touch on Hamas's strategy against Israel. Um, I have friends on both sides of this divide. I'm very careful not to say too much about it. Um, so I'm going to try and limit this to military strategy here. Hamas has for years, as have many of the Palestinian movements, claimed rightly or wrongly that Israel is breaking international law. They have for years done terrorist attacks, which actually are completely unacceptable. And many of these rocket strikes are just that. But it seems to have done the one thing that might get them a result, and that's persuade some people in Israel who appear to have shoe size IQs when they think about how war should be fought to put ground forces into one of the most heavily built up areas in the planet. My suspicion is someone in Hamas has read a book about Stalingrad or the battle for Leningrad or possibly Verdun or maybe had a little look at the battle for, of Berlin and as Jeff pointed out to me earlier, the Silo Heights and the catastrophe that hit uh, Zhukov's force there. So, what Israel is doing by flattening large tracts of Gaza potentially is creating a massive fortress. And yes, they have much more capable weapon systems than are available in World War One or World War Two. But they don't have a million troops. And if you look at Stalingrad, successful attacks there were between three and ten to one in terms of troop numbers. Because you needed that just so enough people survived to learn how to fight within the city. And by the end of the German attacks, just before the Soviet counterstrike there, German infantry units were essentially down from regimental size with three battalions or two battalions down to a couple of companies. If Israel wants to guard its military, it'll put troops on the ground inside Gaza. And from a political standpoint, the Gulf Arabs, who currently will not support Palestine for all power reasons, I think might just change their political view on this. That would be a disaster for us all. So I think we all need to go away and contemplate this and possibly contact representatives to get governments to push both sides as hard as possible to negotiate a reasonable treaty here. The other side of that is if they do negotiate a treaty, both sides should have their feet held to the fire somehow. And I'm not going to go into how that should be done yet. I'm still thinking that to make sure that breaches of those treaties do not cause another conflagration with innocent people on both sides of that divide getting killed for no apparent reason that I can see. So that's all I've got to say about Gaza. Have you got anything to say, Jeff? Um, well, the biggest hot potato in all of this for me is that while one can one can say that oh uh, Hamas has been firing rockets, Israel re um, blockaded various checkpoints. Um, there, there's an interesting book I read about. 
the best emergency trauma response teams um, in that area were on the Israeli side of the border. So if you have a car crash, then you know you, you I can see why there is resentment to uh, you know from both sides. But the one thing I do say is that all this started because Hamas did decide to jump over and start shooting civilians and corral concert goers and what have you. So while we can hold both sides to the fire, we've got to find a way to make sure that that initial flashpoint is it's, it's understood that's what caused this latest bout of intense violence. So I think I don't know. Someone I, I think, in Hamas I think, is going I, to have I, to be I think the big problem I think the big problem we've got throughout this mm. has been if one side is willing to conciliate, the other side is so pissed off it won't play ball. Yeah. So you've got fairly moderate Palestinian leaders elsewhere saying enough. Oh, Fatah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got you've got the more radical ones, specifically Hamas, but I know there'll be other smaller ones that we don't know much about. Hmm. And they are they feed on. The legal settlement of the West Bank, the forced evictions of Palestinians from their homes, and they glorify the murder of civilians, which makes them just as bad. And then we have the current Israeli government, and it is saying, wow. This is completely unacceptable. We are absolutely 100% innocent. We're going to do all of these things. How many bad guys have they killed out of the four and a half thousand or whatever it is Palestinians that appear to have been killed? Uh, I'll, I'll imagine they they have probably killed a, a certain number. I mean, Mossad oscillate between very stupid and not stupid in any way, shape or form. And I wouldn't be surprised if what's happening right now is got the not stupid elements kicking into high gear. Yeah, um, I, mean, I know one of the masterminds. I, I know I, the I one think, of the masterminds of the hostage take. Oh. Yeah, I, I think I think to be honest, the, in, in Mossad's defense, I actually think they probably had a pretty good idea overall, or should I say Israeli intelligence organs did. But I think hmm. unfortunately much like the 9-11 day battle in America, where the information sharing was going that little bit too slow. Um well, they had a very good idea the operation was starting and people could well die. The right people didn't get the information at the right time. Exactly. I would yeah. find it really strange if Israeli intelligence hadn't picked up on some of this stuff. But if you've got Mossad here and you have military intelligence here and Air Force intelligence there and I don't know, the civilian police there and the diplomatic contacts, contacts and all that and everyone's not quite joined up. Mm. You're going to get a delay in the the, the the ability to gather and then use the information. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is kind of like this is kind of like in 1940. We read a lot of Luftwaffe's mail mm. during the Battle of Britain, but we couldn't always use that tactically. In fact, we very rarely could because we've usually found out about it after the raid was in the air. Interesting. Mm. Right, so, 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 so it, it, this was because, as I recall, Luftwaffe Enigma being three was a three rotor, but it was the cheap one. It was a basic one. The idea was yeah. just to keep just enough tactical edge um, for the instruction to launch whatever mission what would be secret. Now, that's all it takes. And the other thing is, bear in mind that the people inside Gaza. I suspect, and I don't know because I don't actually know a Gazan uh, national. And I know people who are Palestinian, I know people who are Israeli, and I also know people who are Muslim and Jewish, depending on, on where they're from. But I don't know someone specifically from Gaza just now, so I cannot be sure. But my suspicion is most of them don't want this conflict. Indeed. I suspect that most of those people just want left alone to get on their lives. The problem is Hamas have sufficient influence within a certain percentage of the community 
that people will not give them away. No. And by converting Gaza from a bit of a rabbit warren of tower blocks and you know blocks of flats and all this kind of stuff to what is essentially going to be a pile of rubble. And if you go take a look at Stalingrad, the pictures of it towards the end of the battle or Berlin at the end of the war, you'll see what I mean. It suddenly becomes a, essentially a money pit for any attacker. And the defenders are able to move through sewers, through tunnels, dug over the tops of buildings and so on underneath, the, you know, near the top, under the rubble. Neither side are going to find this easy. But a bunch of kids with Kalashnikovs actually have a big edge because they'll probably know their local area. Mm. You know, this is not looking like a good thing. So my appeal, and I'm going to repeat this, is for both sides to talk and come up with an amicable settlement. Get this over and done with. We do not need another war on this planet. We've got enough as it is in our plate. You know, um, and we're back to... We're going to end up back at Ukraine next time we have this chat. I'm sure of it because I'm pretty sure that map's not going to have changed all that much, guys. You know, you know. Anyway, I have had about enough tonight. Um, I'm sure you'll all have stuff that you want to say or talk about or whatever about what we're saying or what I've said. Um, you probably won't be very happy about some of it. That's the whole point of having the comments down below. Please feel free to like it if you like it. Uh, if you don't um, like it, tell us you don't like it. Put dislike. dislike. If you want to find out more about what we do, there will be links to the company websites and so on, so you can buy some games, which would be really appreciated. You can do some pre sonic sale in World War One, uh, and you can consider getting hold of a watchtower, which will come out after Christmas. Now, I'm sorry about that, guys. There's nothing to be done about it. Um, the other thing, just before I go freely, we have yeah another new print solution, yeah, another, another print print rent bust. Print rent bust. That did delay that things did by about things four weeks. By about four weeks. Anyway, so, anyway, so like it, dislike like it, it dislike quick it. follow, quick follow. Come and see us. Have a chat. Have a chat. Take a look at the websites. Have a really good weekend. What's really left of it? Weekend. Um, and really, and thank you so much for having a wee so look at what we're doing. Take care, guys. Have a good one. Bye bye.